Hey there, fellow misfits. This is Kate. And I'm Kale. Welcome to Horrorwood. actually recording from Texas to see my family. It's my mom's whoop, whoop. birthday today and it was my dad's birthday yesterday. Happy so, birthday, Kale's parents. Thanks. Uh, so, you know, we're going to go to the dance hall tonight, but my sisters came <laughs> and brought three out of the five kids. So some of my nieces and nephews are here. Um, Wait, what happened to the other two kids? One of them uh, is in Wisconsin and then the other one uh, he's a high schooler and he does not have the same spring break. So three of them had the same spring break. I was like, is this a situation where they were like, we're just going to take the three that we like? <laughs> Actually, they probably did take. No, no, that's not true. My youngest niece is with me right now and um, she's, she's going to come say hi. She's a little shy. Hi. A little louder. Hi, Miss Fitz. Hi, Miss Fitz. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. Hi. <laughs> Isn't she so big now, though? I know. That's crazy. It's crazy to see them grow. I mean, like your nieces. Well, she's the same age as my youngest niece. So, yeah. She's a rock star now. I should send you some of her videos. <gasps> she plays electric Please guitar. <gasps> and she's like fucking good. And it, she and I have a connection. We have a bond. <laughs> yes. She, she's really good. She impresses me every day. So does oh, the other one. That. But she just doesn't, the other one doesn't text me as much or ever. <laughs> <laughs> so she doesn't get the big shout out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anywho. Oh, so you're in Texas. I'm in Chicago and it's snowing here. <laughs> it was 90 degrees here yesterday. And right now it's 80. That's wild. Which is. Which I must say, I came here from California and we're having like crazy weather, um, mm -hmm. super yeah. cold, rainy, awesome though. Like I love a good thunderstorm. So I've been like mm -hmm. really relishing in it. Reveling, relishing, whatever. I think they both work. I think so too. Yeah, it's snowing here. It's wild, but I like it. But but also like not really. I got a, a little bit of a sunburn yesterday. I was walking around 6th Street on, in Austin and it was 90 degrees. South by Southwest is here right now. So oh, okay. it's like, it's like crazy and, but it was fun to walk around and I, I sweat. The fact that you got a sunburn yesterday and I haven't seen the sun in two months. <laughs> I'm like, what's that like? I'm okay with it though, because I hate the sun. I know you hate the sun. I know we're, we're so opposites, mm -hmm. but I do love thunderstorms. Oh my gosh. Love them. And I love the snow. So I don't know. I love it all. Yeah. Well, when this is airing, it's technically Monday, the day after the Oscars. Uh, we are recording this on Sunday, just a few hours before the Oscars. Um, are you doing anything for the Oscars tonight? No. And you know what? I actually thought the Oscars were tomorrow. No. <laughs> I've been seeing, I've been scrolling through and for some reason in my head, I had that it was tomorrow. Um, no, I guess not. Because you didn't even realize they were today? <laughs> no. Yeah, we're going to an Oscar party later, which will be fun. Fun. And even though we can't say anything about the Oscar winners this year because we don't know them yet as we're recording, <laughs> I wanted to do this specific episode at this time because the woman I'm getting ready to tell you about was a publicist and award season was really her time to shine. So what some people don't realize is that when it comes to award season, well, first off, there are so many awards aside from just the Oscars. Yeah. You've got Directors Guild, Writers Guild, Screen Actors Guild, Golden Globes, Critics Choice, Independent Spirit, Grammy. Like there's more, there's but that's just what comes up on the top of my head. So before you sit down on your couch to watch, let's say the Oscars, first there's a group of people whose job it is to watch everything out there from the past year and decide what they think should get nominated. They're like a panel? Yeah, it's a committee. Okay. But obviously it's impossible to watch everything, but members of the Academy are required to watch a percentage. 
And in order for studios to make sure their films are being watched, they hire publicists to help with their awards campaign. The campaign will tip... Starting again, because I just malfunctioned. (laughs) The campaign will typically involve sending screeners, um, which is just basically DVDs of the Mm -hmm. movies, out to voting members. They'll set up in-person screenings where they'll often have the cast, maybe the director there for a QA. and a They'll set up press junkets where usually it's a couple of cast members being interviewed by like Entertainment Tonight, Extra, mm-hmm. or other media outlets. Basically, a publicist does everything they can to make sure their client, whether it's a studio, a writer, an actor, whoever, is at the forefront of everyone's mind when it comes time to vote. It's very similar to a political campaign. The vibe I'm getting sound, sounds very election-y. It is. And it's it's really weird and kind of gross when you really start to think about it. Mm-hmm. But it makes sense because, you know, if you win an award, if your studio wins or an actor or whatever, that's, that's money. That's more work. That's oh, right, right. your career. So it's just it's how that game is played. And this was where Ronnie Chasen excelled. Ronnie Chasen was born Veronica Sue Cohen on October 17th, 1946 in Kingston, New York. She had an older brother, Larry Cohen, and the two grew up in the Riverdale and Washington Heights neighborhoods. As a kid, Ronnie was really athletic and very social. She loved being around people. And according to her brother, she had some mad skills when it came to yo-yos. Oh. She entered and won multiple yo-yo competitions. Do you remember or were you even aware of my yo-yo phase? That sounds sexual, but like I'm actually talking about yo-yos. <laughs> with like the, the string. string with um, the- <laughs> was it during college? No, it was when I was in L.A. Okay. I collected them for a while. Oh, you collected them. Yeah. It wasn't that and you I, had to have one like a fidget. It was like you were. No, it was like them. I just thought they were cool because there were all these different ones and I would bring them to set with me like back when I went to set. I mean, that's a good, good way to like take time. Past time. Yeah. Yeah. Past time. Uh, people love a woman with a yo-yo. I just have to put that out there. Don't know why, but. Okay. Thanks for the tip. Great. So I just thought it was a fun little fact about her. Her first brush with celebrity came when she was around five or six years old. Her brother took her to Madison Square Garden to watch a rodeo. And it was there that she got. I know you wouldn't think rodeo. Yes, celebrity. Rodeo MSG. I love it. Um, And her brother was like 10 years older than her. So he's a teenager at this point taking his little sister. Did they ever say like how she got her nickname? Did he nickname her? I mean, it makes sense with her full name, but. I just wondered. The Ronnie part? Yeah, the Ronnie. I think it's so cute. Yeah, it's just a shorter version of Veronica. And our friend Erin, her um, siblings nicknamed her Ronnie, I think, too. I always thought her pronunciation was Roni. Oh, maybe it is Roni. Okay. We'll have to to ask her. Hey, (laughs) Erin. She's not listening. Uh, (laughs) So her brother took her to Madison Square. Oh, sorry. I already said that. So at the rodeo, it was there that she got to shake hands with Dale Evans. Dale Evans was a leading lady in Westerns. She was a singer and she starred on the Roy Rogers show. She was a big deal back then. Was the Roy Rogers a talent show? It was like a variety show. Righty. But that's what that was. You got me. That was the word I was looking for. I saw it on your face. I was like, she's thinking variety. So Ronnie was starstruck when she got to shake her hand. And when she and Larry were on the subway afterwards going home, she kept telling everyone, I touched the Queen of the West, like just to random strangers. Aww, I love that. When Ronnie went to college, she majored in journalism at Hofstra University in New York. Hofstra is the largest private university on Long Island, and it's also where Francis Ford Coppola got his bachelor's. So pretty decent alumni there. Yeah. Ronnie dappled in acting and modeling. I found an early headshot of hers. She's stunning. I'll try to post it. She kind of looked like Barbara Streisand when she was younger. At first, I thought I was looking at pictures of Barbara Streisand. Oh, yeah. I know that. I know that look. Uh, Her brother, Larry, started making films and hired her as his publicist, which was her first experience working in PR. She promoted his films early in his career. 
But I don't think that's where she initially saw herself working in the entertainment industry. I think she always thought to herself that she would be an actor. She actually got bit parts here and there. She worked on Guiding Light and The Patty Duke Show. And in the 70s, she moved out to L.A. to pursue her dream. She was going all in. She even changed her name from Cohen to Chasen. Her brother said she did it because Ronnie Cohen didn't sound great as a stage name. And she wanted a strong name. Which I think Ronnie Cohen sounds great, but that's I just me. I do, but okay. It's believed she got the name Chasen from a famous restaurant that used to exist in Hollywood called Chasen's. It was a celebrity hotspot. Elizabeth Taylor, Frank Sinatra, Walt Disney. These were just a few of its customers. So it was like a big deal. It wasn't there when you were there. Like, have no, you ever heard of Chasen's? Okay. No, it, it closed a while ago. Uh, And I can see why she would choose Chasen for a name. It was Hollywood. It was related Mm -hmm. to being very sociable. It was a happening place, which I think is how Ronnie saw herself. She Mm -hmm. was sociable. She was ready to make her mark in the business. But Ronnie quickly realized that trying to make it as an actor in Hollywood wasn't all it was cracked up to be. There was a ton of rejection, and Ronnie wasn't really someone who took no easily. She decided acting wasn't for her. Where she could really shine was in publicity. Her brother said she was a natural publicist. He said, oh, how she loved to throw a party. You know, that makes sense. Like, she kind of wanted that acting role. Um, She majored in journalism. So we already know she's probably social because you you almost have to be for that. And it it does feel like it could lead a really good segue into like publicity and it that whole combines like, all of her skills together yeah, like encompasses yeah I love it Ronnie began working as the head of publicity at American International Pictures which would eventually become part of MGM she then went to work for the renowned PR agency Rogers and Cowan her clients there included Natalie Wood Alan Carr, who is the producer of the movie Grease, and she also worked with John Travolta once his success from Welcome Back, Cotter took off. Big names. Yes. It was at this agency that Ronnie really cut her teeth, so to speak. It was a really prestigious firm. They were a big deal. And she became the executive vice president of motion pictures there. That's incredible. One, I feel like she's pretty young still. And two, she's a female. Exactly. I'm loving this, especially that International Women's Day just was Mm -hmm. around uh, our corner last week. So I'm I'm loving this so far. She's doing pretty well for herself. So well, in fact, that after 10 years in her position at Rogers and Cowan, Ronnie decided she was ready to open a company of her own. Damn. Go get her. We love a powerful woman. We love a woman who starts her own business. Get it. Absolutely. Chasen and Company was a boutique agency Ronnie founded in 1989, where she worked with a broad range of clients, including actors, producers, directors, and screenwriters. But what really catapulted her success was a wise business decision she made early on. She was the first publicist to actively promote songwriters and film composers. Ah. She was able to corner the market on this because no one else was doing it. Done it. Oh, that's awesome. In the early years of her company, she spent a brief amount of time as senior vice president of publicity for MGM. That was in 1993. She was there for a year and then reactivated her company in 1994. So I'm not sure if she was thinking of closing her agency mm-hmm. or if MGM just offered her a ton of money. But she did work there briefly. Vivian Mayer, a publicist who worked for Ronnie at MGM, said, quote, she knew everyone and everyone knew her. She had that rare encyclopedic knowledge of the industry. It reminds me of um, The Devil Wears Prada. Yes. Anne Hathaway's character who has to flip through and she just, she just, she knows it. She knows her stuff. And actually, that's going to come back later, just in a small way. Oh, okay. In addition to pioneering the field of composers and songwriters into public renown, her firm began specializing in handling Oscar campaigns for studios. She would advise them on marketing strategies, particularly if their movie involved music. She would throw these big promotional parties, and she excelled at this. Part of what made her so successful 
was that she was unapologetically pushy, whereas her inability to accept no for an answer didn't work for her as an actor. It's exactly the quality she needed as a publicist. That's fantastic because that's sometimes how you have to be in a business. Oh, I think to run any business, you have to be that way. Good point. Good point. (laughs) Part of her job was to convince journalists to write stories on her clients. So she'd call them up. And if they said no, she would just be like, all right. She was never rude, but she'd just wait a day or two and then call them again and again and again until finally they agreed to do the story. So she had a style and she soared with it. Oh, yeah. She I mean, she did not care about being pushy. I feel that coming off in this like account of her for some reason. I'm so enthralled in this story of her. It's like pushing at me. She's really fascinating. Yeah. I feel like she's here with me or something. I don't know. Publicist Kathy Berlin said, quote, I used to laugh because I'd say she got half her pieces placed because people would say enough already. OK, executives would literally hide behind plants or pillars at events if they saw her coming because they knew they would not be able to get away from her until they agreed to do what she wanted. Which more power to her because if I saw people hide from me every time I walked in a room, I think I'd feel kind of bad about myself. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess I'm not going to be a publicist. But it didn't phase Ronnie. She would walk right up to them and say, don't you just love my client? And she would not let them go. Ronnie was relentless. She didn't take any bullshit, and she wasn't a bullshitter. If she didn't like a pitch, she would look you dead in the eye and say, that's a terrible idea. Oh. And this is partly why she was so well-respected. She wasn't afraid to speak her mind. She once went up to Barbara Lazaroff. Barbara designed Wolfgang Puck's restaurant Spago. And Ronnie told her the restaurant needed an update, particularly the private event room. She said, it's tired looking. And Barbara was agreeable. Who goes up to an interior designer and tells them their design (laughs) sucks and has the designer agree? Ronnie Chasen. She knew what she wanted and she wasn't afraid to go and get it. People in the industry looked at her pushiness as endearing. Mm -hmm. She had a wicked sense of humor and was extremely devoted to her clients. If Ronnie was on your team, you considered yourself incredibly lucky. She seems very charming. Like I'm very charmed by this um, account because I want to keep hearing what she's doing, how she does it. And I can only think that's how it was in her industry. And it's funny how like I already feel like this presence, right? Like... Mm-hmm. I feel like, again, she's in this room, like she's she's kind of telling me like, hey, you got to keep listening. This is about my life. So so I need you to hear yes, this because there's going to be more and it's going to be great. Like, you know, yeah. or whatever. Like, I don't That's know. That's kind of exactly her vibe. Yeah. <laughs> Producer Judy Cairo, who had been a client of Ronnie's, said you could walk into any party, any function, any studio, and Ronnie could tell you every person in the room, their history, filmography, and why they were important for you. Then she'd introduce you to them. So that's kind of the Devil Wears Prada coming back. Yeah, that is a talent. Mm-hmm. And it's also not just a talent. It's it's an intelligence. Well, it, and she did her research. She mm-hmm. She did her research. Despite her company's increasing success, she was still surprisingly old school. Ronnie would call her office line every night to leave a to-do list for the next day on a voicemail. She would send correspondence to reporters via snail mail, even though at this point, pretty much everything had gone digital. Mm -hmm. And she was very private about her age. She felt that if people knew how old she was, it could affect her career and people wouldn't hire her, (sighs) which sadly she was probably right because it's Hollywood and it's America and we suck here. Mm hmm. Aside from being relentless and hardworking, she was also incredibly warm and caring. She was the mother hen of any room, always going around making sure everyone was taken care of and had what they needed. But one habit she had didn't sit well with a lot of Hollywood folk. At fancy events, Ronnie was known to always ask for a doggy bag to take home leftovers. And people had feelings about this. They'd call her chintzy. They'd say she was being tacky. 
if I go to a fancy Hollywood party and the food is good, which you know it is, Hell yeah. you can bet I'm going to be asking for some to go. I'll be like, yes, go ahead and wrap that up. And I'll take that guy's over there, too, because he didn't need all his caviar. Better for the environment, too, because one of our biggest environmental factor concerns is um, wasted food. Yeah. So pff, thank you, Ronnie. But Ronnie wasn't actually taking the food for herself, which is what a lot of people didn't know. She was actually taking it to her mom, who lived up the street from her. Oh, that's even more precious. After events, Ronnie would visit her mom and tell her all about it and give her the fancy food because she just wanted her mom to be able to experience some of that. Yeah. Ronnie was single. She was married briefly in her 20s, but it didn't last. And she didn't have any kids. Her clients were kind of like her kids. She mm. devoted everything to them and everything she did was for them not herself mm -hmm. oscar winning composer hans zimmer was a longtime client of ronnie's and he said quote she told me to tuck in my shirt to smile at the camera to have a shave and not say anything foolish she protected me fiercely and brilliantly i just got the chills that is a mother hen right there totally Given that Ronnie represented a lot of clients that weren't necessarily household names yet, like songwriters, mm -hmm. she would make sure to show up at the red carpet events early with her client so they could get in front of the cameras. Because once the stars rolled in, like that's all anyone cared right. about, you know, yeah. she was really smart. And award season is where she really knew how to shine. She was an Academy member herself and a neighbor of hers used to have a weekly poker meeting. The people at this poker meeting were also Academy members, and Ronnie knew that. So she would just casually drop in on poker night and be like, hey, everybody, hey. what's up? I brought some chips and guac. And, um, oh, who are you thinking about voting for in the Oscar race? Asking for a friend. I love it. Her tactics worked. Because by 2010, Chasen and Company had contributed to over 150 Oscar nominations and numerous wins. Wow. These included seven Best Picture winners, which were The Hurt Locker, Slumdog Millionaire, No Country for Old Men, The Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King, Chicago, Shakespeare in Love, and Driving Miss Daisy. Wow. Yeah. Not oh, just incredible. Not anything to scoff at there. Right. Her music clients earned more than 65 Grammy nominations, winning in six categories, including the coveted Album of the Year. She was considered the premier publicist for some of the world's leading film composers. Yeah. And she also worked on publicity campaigns in theater for such shows as The Lion King, Mary Poppins, Thoroughly Modern Millie. So she stayed busy. So her resume was lengthy. Insane. Yeah. The fall of 2010 was no different. She was working on an Oscar campaign for the film Alice in Wonderland, starring Johnny Depp. And she also represented clients that worked on the movie Burlesque, starring Cher and Christina Aguilera. Okay. Ronnie's clients from that film included the producer, the lighting designer, and songwriter. On Monday, November 15th, 2010, Ronnie got dressed to attend the premiere of Burlesque. She wore a dark blue suit with a cream-colored blouse, along with a pair of satin, leopard print, kitten heel, Manolo Blahniks. Mm. And she brought along her brown leather Prada purse. So she's got some fashion. Oh, she's got some fashion because she's also got some money. Money. <laughs> the premiere took place at what used to be called Grauman's Chinese Theater. And mm -hmm. after the movie, everyone headed over to the W Hollywood Hotel on Hollywood Boulevard for the after party. Diane Warren, the songwriter Ronnie represented on the film, said the two of them had the funnest night. Aww. Diane wrote the song, You Haven't Seen the Last of Me, which was sung by Cher in the movie. And Ronnie was pushing hard to get the song nominated. This was just a couple of weeks before Golden Globe ballots were going to be okay. sent out. So Ronnie was working the room. She's excited. She's in her prime. She's having the best time. She left the party around midnight. She picked up her car from the valet. It was a new 2010 black Mercedes. And she began the drive home. Rolling in style. At 12.22 a.m. while she was driving home, she called her office as she did every evening to leave a voicemail of things that needed to get done the next day. Then just four minutes later at 12.28 a.m., as Ronnie approached the intersection of Sunset and Whittier Drive, 
she merged into the left turn lane, just missing the green arrow. As she sat at the red light, four shots were fired into her vehicle through the front passenger window, hitting her. Uh. Ronnie's car then headed left down Whittier Drive. It's unclear if she drove it down after she was shot or if she was in the process of turning when she was hit Mm -hmm. and the car just rolled. It traveled about a quarter mile before crashing into a concrete light pole, causing the pole to fall over. The impact crushed the right front end of the vehicle and caused the driver's side airbag to deploy. A couple drove by just after the crash happened and found her, but the Beverly Hills Police Department had already been alerted because residents in the area called about possible gunfire. So the police were there pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Because again, this is Beverly Hills and you don't hear gunfire in Beverly Hills. When police arrived at the scene... They found Ronnie slumped forward. She had blood dripping from her nose. There was a gurgling sound coming from her mouth. Her eyes were wide open, but not blinking. Mm. And she did not have a pulse. Her hazard lights were blinking and her car stereo was still running. It was playing White Rabbit by Jefferson Airplane. If you listen to White Rabbit after this episode, it's... Pretty creepy, and it puts you right there in the scene. I'm actually, I'll try to link it in the show notes. Okay. Ronnie was taken to Cedar Sinai Medical Center, and efforts were made to resuscitate her, including a thoracotomy, which is where they make an incision between the ribs to get access to the lungs and heart. Doctors attempted to repair her pericardium. That's the protective membrane that surrounds the heart. But unfortunately, Ronnie's wounds were fatal. She was pronounced dead at 1.12 a.m. on November 16th. Of the four bullets that struck Ronnie, two were not considered rapidly fatal. One that hit her in the back and another that entered through the right side of her chest, exited, then re-entered through the left side of her chest and exited. Because it's coming from like it's the It's coming from the right window. side. Yeah. Yep. Oh, holy shit. She... She went through a a lot in a very short time with the gunshot. Yes, this all happened very quickly. Neither of these two were fatal. The one that hit her in the chest twice went through skin, muscle, and fat, but there was no cavity penetration. Isn't that wild? That it went through, exited, went through again, exited, and that was not the fatal shot. Right. (sighs) Of the other two shots, one was considered fatal and the other rapidly fatal. Okay. One entered her right shoulder, essentially shattering the bone, and exited through her back. And the other, the one considered rapidly fatal, entered through her right shoulder, traveled to her chest wall, her ribs, Mm. her right upper lung, her pericardium, and then her heart. This bullet did not exit her body. She had a massive amount of blood that had collected in the space between the chest wall and the lung. And as I said, this was the rapidly fatal shot. I'm having a hard time picturing the third one more than the fourth. The fourth makes sense to me completely. This isn't necessarily the order in which she was hit. The autopsy oh, couldn't determine that. Got it. Okay. These are now just it's making I mean, more sense. She was hit yep. one, two, three, four. Three, four. Got it. We, okay. We don't know which one hit first. Now we're now it's all making sense to me. Yeah. I'll link her entire autopsy report because I know some of you misfits are like me and find those interesting. Um, news of Ronnie's death stunned Hollywood. Yeah. Was this a case of road rage, a robbery, a random drive by? Rumors began swirling. Some believed the shooting was the result of a business deal gone wrong. Others thought it had to do with gambling debts. And early reports stated that the shooting was the work of a hired hitman who had pulled up next to Ronnie while she waited at the stoplight. Damn. Was a family member involved? In a will she drew up in 1994, 
Ronnie left pretty much her entire estate, which at the time of her death was valued at $6.1 million. Actually, that increased because that was the value at the time she drew that will up in 1994. Right. So then she accrued more. Yeah. There was more because she inherited money from her mother and she invested that. So it was more than $6.1 million. And I was going to ask, is Larry, her brother, still alive at this point? I mean... At this point in the story, he's still alive. He is not alive today. Got it. Okay. Because he kind of, to me, got her start in a weird, you know, in an interesting way, right? That's why I was like, where's Larry in this? I'm feeling for him. Mm -hmm. So Ronnie left most of her estate to her niece, Melissa, Larry's daughter. Okay. But she had two nieces. Oh. To the other one, she only left $10. So there was clearly something amiss in her relationship with that second niece. However, it doesn't sound like that niece had hard feelings about it. She she came out later and she said she understood she was sorry that Ronnie was gone, but it doesn't sound like she had hard feelings about it. Do you know, were they adults at this time? Yeah, they definitely would have been. Okay. All right. $10. That's so bizarre. There were just so many questions with this case, and people turned toward the BHPD for answers. The thing with murder in Beverly Hills, though, is that it just doesn't happen that often. Right. (laughs) Therefore, officers in that jurisdiction don't have a lot of experience when it comes to investigating those type of crimes. But not long after Ronnie's death, they got a break in the case. A man by the name of Laramie Bacay was in his home watching an episode of America's Most Wanted, and Ronnie's case was featured on the episode. Okay. Now, I feel like I need to go back and watch this. And Laramie felt he had information that could help in the case. Laramie was a disabled musician living on government assistance. He resided on the third floor of the Harvey Apartments, which was a 177-unit building of low-income housing. Okay. Laramie described the residents of this building as being in their own world. He said they were often on drugs. Some people had schizophrenia. Everyone was struggling in one way or another. And Laramie believed his neighbor, who lived just a few doors down from him, a black man by the name of Harold Martin Smith, was Ronnie's killer. Laramie didn't call in his tip right away, however, because Harold already had a record. He'd spent close to 20 years in prison for two separate robberies. The first was a purse snatching in 198, sorry, 1998 in Beverly Hills. The second was a robbery in which the female fought back and Harold broke her jaw. So that got the longer sentence. Laramie knew this would be his third strike, likely resulting in a life sentence. Laramie described Harold as one of the most polite, most sensitive individuals in the building. He said nobody ever had a problem with Harold and he'd never seen him do any drugs or smoke or even swear. However, two weeks after the murder and after seeing it on America's Most Wanted, Laramie changed his mind about keeping quiet and felt compelled to call in with information he had on Harold Smith. Hmm. Laramie stated that 90 minutes after the murder occurred, So this would have been around 2 a.m. Harold knocked on Laramie's door, asking if the police had been there. Had there been anything on TV? Then Harold said to him, we haven't had this conversation. Laramie said that a few hours later, at 11 a.m., Harold knocked on his door again, asking if he had a dollar he could borrow. Harold said, I need to go get my bicycle. Laramie asked, where is it? And Harold answered, It's in Beverly Hills. Sus. (laughs) Laramie stated, I was at a loss for words. I knew what this was. Laramie said that Harold often talked about not having money, not having a job, and that he was, quote, always talking about suicide. Laramie also stated that one week after the killing, Harold was evicted for not being able to pay his rent And so he allowed Harold to store some of his things, uh, two boxes in a duffel bag, at his place. So now Laramie's keeping some of Harold's things in his home. 
So if he's letting him store his stuff at his place, it sounds like he's trying to help his buddy out. So why did he change his mind about turning him in? Right. Money. Harold Matzner, chairman of the Palm Springs Film Festival and publicist Michael Levine, each set up reward offerings totaling $125,000 for information leading to the arrest and conviction of Ronnie's killer. Thanks to Laramie's tip, police immediately turned their attention to Harold Smith. On December 1st, 2010, at 5.30 p.m., BHPD detectives showed up at the Harvey apartments to confront Harold. He had apparently been coming back every now and then to the apartment building, so they were keeping an eye on him. According to police, upon seeing the officers, Harold took a gun out of his pocket and shot himself in the head in the building's lobby. There was no suicide note, and on his person were a couple of papers. One was a flyer advertising... $100 a $100 a week lodging. The other had numbers on it for a job coach in Pasadena, warehouse labor in West LA, and a forklift operator in Santa Fe Springs. That's what was found on him? That's all that was found on him. So he was looking for work and he was looking for a right. place he could afford to live. To get out of that apartment. Well, he'd already been evicted. Oh, right. So he's trying to um, find a, a cheaper right. home. I have a couple of questions. Mm-hmm. One of which, she was gunned down in in November. Yes. And this is how long after December or something? This is two weeks later. Two weeks later. Only two weeks later. Gosh, this is December 1st. This is so rapid. Wow. Oh, I forgot my second question. Keep going. Okay. You might think of it as I go. After months of... Go ahead. Do we have any idea of a motivation? Getting there. Got it. Okay. Cool. I mean, not cool, but you know what I mean. Yeah. After months of investigation, BHPD concluded that the gun Harold used to shoot himself was the same one used to shoot Ronnie Chasen, and that it had been stolen off an LAPD cop three years prior. Eight months after Ronnie's death, BHPD declared that Harold was Ronnie's killer, that he acted alone in a robbery gone wrong, and the case was closed. But... This didn't sit well for a lot of people, and rightfully so, because the Beverly Hills Police Department conducted a less than thorough investigation of the crime. Remember, they don't have a lot of experience when it comes to investigating murders. Right. And although they probably should have reached out to a larger jurisdiction for help with the case, many police forces don't do this simply out of ego. BHPD Chief David Snowden, who later left the department following a corruption scandal, refused to seek the assistance of a more experienced unit. Here's just a little bit about the Beverly Hills Police Department. Oh boy. It was sued in 2021 for disproportionately arresting Black pedestrians the previous year following the George Floyd protests. Mm. And Chief Snowden's successor, Sandra Spagnoli, retired in 2020 after a series of lawsuits, including allegations of racist remarks, resulting in the city of Beverly Hills paying out millions. Mm -hmm. So the city doesn't have a great track record when it comes to the treatment of Black people. There were multiple requests for security camera footage to prove that Harold Smith was indeed at the scene of the crime, but BHPD never turned any over. Retired LAPD homicide detective T.T. Williams Jr., which I do hope he goes by T.T. because I I really like it. Like it. And T.T. Williams Jr., like, I don't know, something about that whole name together. I do. I'm into it. It's like, yeah. He was skeptical about the lack of camera footage. He said, quote, there has to be some security cameras in that neighborhood that would have Mm -hmm. caught him. I mean, Beverly Hills. Beverly Hills. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. You have a black man supposedly on a bike in the middle of the night. He'd be stopped 15 times. He would have stood out like a sore thumb. So that's another thing. The bike. Police are claiming that Harold acted alone and that it was an attempted robbery. So a black man riding his bike in the middle of the night in Beverly Hills attempted to rob a woman and then shot her four times? 
crimes. Something's not adding up. Harold had been convicted of robbery before, but had never killed anyone or attempted to kill anyone that I can find. And there is no evidence that a robbery was even attempted. When police arrived on the scene, Ronnie's Prada handbag was sitting on the passenger seat. Mm. It still had her wallet and cell phone in it. Her Manolo Blahniks were on the floorboard on the driver's side. She clearly had valuables that a thief could have taken. The window was shattered from the gunshot, so all a thief had to do was just reach in and grab the purse. And grab it, yeah. And maybe the robbery explanation would be more plausible if Harold's fingerprints had been found inside her car, but the BHPD did not test for fingerprints. At all? At all. Isn't that like one of the first things that you should do when you're, you've got like a murder scene? They just like showed up on the scene and they were like, they're like, oh, fuck, uh, let's get her to the hospital. Um, I guess there's, I guess this is a murder. Let's just see if someone tells us who did it. We'll just believe that person. <laughs> wow. Chief Snowden claimed the gun Harold used to shoot himself was a match for the gun used to kill Ronnie. He actually announced this at a press conference saying it was a complete match. They had their guy. However, ballistics test didn't provide enough evidence to prove that. There is absolutely no forensic evidence that places Harold Smith at the scene of the crime. Several of Ronnie's friends and colleagues, many of whom were with her the night she died, were never interviewed by police. Wouldn't you want to question the last people known to have seen and talked to her? I've I've learned that from you. Come on. (laughs) Merle Stebbins, or Stevens, not sure, S-T-E-B-E-N-S, a former police investigator who specializes in crime scene processing, he has over 45 years of homicide experience. He said, quote, This was not a very well-investigated homicide, and it's easiest to point a finger at the most vulnerable people in town. Mm. This is a fucking homicide, guys. This isn't a little shoplifting. This has to have all of your undivided attention. That that was all Merle saying that. That's a clear statement, and I am here for it. Larry Cohen, Ronnie's brother, never believed Harold was involved. He thought it was probably a case of road rage. But some of Ronnie's friends disagree. They were suspicious of a particular person in Ronnie's life, who I won't name because there's no evidence that person was involved. Mm. But it's interesting nonetheless. And of course, that person wasn't interviewed and those friends right. were not interviewed by police and as for laramie bacay the tipster mm-hmm. well we're not done with him what he wanted his money oh of course he right, claimed right. it was his tip that led cops to the suspect and he wanted his hundred and twenty five thousand dollar reward but harold matzner who had announced the reward offering said he wasn't so sure Harold Smith was the guy Mm -hmm. and he didn't feel there was enough evidence to prove it. He said if the BHPD could provide proof that Harold did it, like with camera footage from the scene of the crime, he would, of course, pay the reward. Right. But the BHPD couldn't provide any actual proof. So Laramie Bacay sued Sued. Harold Matzner (laughs) and the publicist Michael Levine, who was also offering the reward money. Michael was. I found the lawsuit on Scribd, and I'll link it. In it, Laramie is referred to as John Doe because at the time he wanted to remain anonymous. Mm. He has since changed his tune on that as well, but we'll get there. Harold Matzner uh, actually encouraged the lawsuit because he felt it would force the BHPD to turn over evidence. Yeah, yeah, it didn't, but of we'll course. talk a little bit about more of that in a minute. <laughs> I already feel like they've scuffed it up enough. Oh, yeah. Meanwhile, Ronnie's murder piqued the interest of documentary filmmaker Ryan Katzenbach. He often took Whittier as a shortcut, so he was familiar with the area where Ronnie was shot, and he just thought there were some questionable things about the case that he wanted to explore further. So he filed a Public Records Act request for info on the case, including Ronnie's autopsy but the BHPD declined to turn anything over. Ryan eventually sued the BHPD in 2013 after learning that Chief David Snowden had granted full access to the file to BHPD forensic specialist Clark Fogg, who then used the materials to write a book in which he claimed the questions being raised about the crime were driven by conspiracy theorists. So basically... The police department in Beverly Hills 
let this guy have all the information just so that he could write a book saying like, yeah, all you people questioning this, you're all conspiracy theorists. Like we did our job and you guys have it all wrong. And we're not going to let anyone else see this information. (laughs) It's hurting my heart for her and then the loved ones who lost her or her friends that are grieving for her still. And it's like now it's just turned into this ridiculous mess of people trying to either gain money or like clout or whatever it is. Police departments have never really been known to, (laughs) you know, tell the whole life story of a victim. (laughs) True. And I get that. Okay, I get that. That's not their job. But there's just something that's unsettling about all this for me. Eventually, a lawyer for the police department turned over a portion of the requested materials to Ryan, but so much of it was redacted. Ryan also requested the security footage from the Harvey apartments where police claimed Harold had shot himself in the head as they confronted him, but he's never received that footage. In 2013, Laramie agreed to tell his story on camera to Ryan. He was still operating anonymously, so he would only do it with his face shadowed, his voice Mm -hmm. altered, and name withheld. But later, he learned that Ryan had taken on Harold Matzner as a financial backer for a documentary film he was doing on the case. And Laramie refused to work with him after that. Right. he was still pissed that he didn't get that money. Get the money. So as, as far as that lawsuit against Matzner... He was awarded a partial settlement. Would you like to know what he bought? Um, okay, if it was 125K, I'm guessing a partial would be like maybe 80 or less. So we don't know the amount. It's not disclosed, but okay. Um something really silly. Like he probably should have bought a condo, but I, I'm guessing like a boat or something. I also thought he would use it towards housing, but that's not what Laramie bought with his settlement. He bought himself a limited edition, bright green, manual transmission Camaro. He said, quote, I had to use the money within a year or else I lose my disability and supplemental benefits. I see a psychiatrist to this day. Tipping isn't making one phone call and getting money. Every day I think I'm getting into my car because a lovely lady died. So I'm just going to leave that there. I mean... You know what? I bet he did have to use it in order to keep his other benefits. I'm sure. sure. I believe that. I'm sure he did need a vehicle. Of course. We're just going to leave that alone. Yeah. Okay. In 2016, Laramie decided to come forward and reveal his identity, which he did by going to the Hollywood Reporter. The Hollywood Reporter had been doing a lot of investigating for this case over the years. Okay. Was there a reason he decided to come forward? Oh, yes. When asked why, he said, quote, because after six years, I've felt forgotten and I want credit. Due to my assistance, the Ronnie Chasen case was solved and closed. Good grief. Okay. Okay, dude, you're not making yourself look super credible here. I have some thoughts on Laramie. Oh, please, please share them. (laughs) Maybe everything he's saying is the truth. Maybe it is. But it's just hard to believe someone who clearly has ulterior motives. He said that Harold, you know, had said all this stuff to him, questioning if the cops had come, asking him to store his things. But something I didn't mention before is that Laramie also claimed he and Harold weren't close. They just sometimes shared food bank provisions. He said he liked raisins and apple juice. Um... Okay, you seemed pretty buddy-buddy with him before. Mm -hmm. No shell casings, live rounds, or weapon were recovered at the crime scene. Laramie said that after Harold shot himself, investigators went up to his room, Laramie's room, to go through Harold's things that were being stored there. And the first box they opened up, according to Laramie, a detective said, quote, holy fuck, there's four empty shell casings. I don't know if that actually happened. Maybe it did. Seems a little convenient. Uh, Yeah. Also, did Laramie know that it was four gunshots and that no shell casings had been found at the scene? Like, was that... I don't know if that was public knowledge or not. Right. I'm starting to feel like Laramie's maybe involved. I'm not accusing anyone here. I'm not making any assumptions. I'm just saying maybe cops should reopen the case and have a little chat with Laramie, that's all. Yeah, some sussy sketch going on. 
He mentioned that Harold had told him he left his bike in Beverly Hills. Remember that? Right. Yeah. The intersection where the shooting occurred was 16 miles from Harold Smith's apartment. If he was at the scene and he left his bike, how did he get home? He didn't have money for the bus because according to Laramie, he asked for a dollar to go back to Beverly Hills and get his bike. And where would he have left it? It seems that it seems that's something that would have been noticed by cops or yeah. by residents in the area. Maybe not. I don't know. But it just seems unlikely that he would have ditched his only mode of transportation if he were trying to flee a scene. And if you see an abandoned bike, I mean, in a scene. Yeah, where it's nearby. You're going to collect that. I just think as quickly as neighbors called mm-hmm. and as quickly as police arrived. They would have seen somebody on damn I bike. I feel like he could have gotten far if no. he was on a bike or on foot running towards a bus yeah. or whatever. What I do believe is the BHPD got this one tip from this Laramie guy. He was the only tipster in the entire case. And they had confirmation bias. Mm-hmm. They were looking for any motive they could find. They wanted a closed case. In this case, they decided the motive was a botched robbery to make Harold the, cul- the culprit. But they never had to turn any evidence over to a prosecutor. There was never a trial because Harold had shot himself, allegedly. So they could sort of tie it all up with a neat little bow and call it a day. Mm. Stan Kephart or Kephart? I'm going to say Kephart because Kephart says it says, sounds wrong. Yeah. <laughs> it's K E P H A R T. So I'm just going to say Although I could over. see why you might say it like that, but yeah. yeah. Uh, Stan Kephart, a former, a former police chief, said it's not what you think about a suspect, it's what you can prove. Mm. And I don't think the BHPD proved anything here. Mm-mm. No. Kathy Berlin, the publicist I mentioned earlier, said, quote, Ronnie would have pushed for details. She wouldn't have let it go so easily. If this had happened to anyone else, she would have been outraged and wouldn't have stopped. She would she would have called then Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger and asked, why aren't you doing anything? Yeah, she'd probably solve the case herself. Yeah, probably. (laughs) Ronnie Chasen was buried on Sunday, November 21st at Hillside Memorial Park and Mortuary in Los Angeles. There were close to a thousand people in attendance. Kathy said her funeral would have stunned her. I think she would have been speechless for the first time in her life. (sighs) Oh, that is a beautiful sentiment because it means so much. Mm -hmm. Lily Zanuck, a producer and friend that Ronnie worked with, spoke at her funeral and joked that she would have been so pissed that now her age has become part of her name and all the stories written about her murder. Forgot about that. Because it has. On January 16th, 2011, exactly two months after Ronnie was killed, the Golden Globes were held. Ronnie's client, Diane Warren, won for best song for You Haven't Seen the Last of Me from Burlesque. I've got my fist in the air. I don't know if anybody can. Oh, they can't see it. Duh. When she got up to accept her award, Diane said, I want to dedicate this to someone a lot of you knew and all of us loved, to Ronnie Chasen. But before she even finished the sentence, the audience erupted in applause. Oh, that's beautiful. What do you think about this case? Well, it's unsolved for one. Yeah, it's it's a closed case, but I don't think it's a solved case. Yeah, I there's there's more. There's some things that just don't line up, you know? And mm-hmm. again, for some reason, I just felt attached to the story as soon as you started. I don't know. Her journey just seemed like um a story that I wanted to follow and it wasn't like the the longest episode we've ever done or that you've ever mm-hmm. researched, right? Like there was something about it though that just made me drawn to the, to her. She was a go-getter. She was a self-made woman. She was born in the 40s, so she's a baby boomer and it was much harder for them than it is for us even and our the generations after us to to be able to like step into that light. It's why a lot of her friends struggle with the outcome because mm-hmm. They don't feel like this could have just been such a a banal incident. Yeah. That there had to be something more to it. Because I mentioned earlier in the episode that they believe there was a hired hitman. Mm -hmm. And the Deadline article, the headline is like, police have an idea of who hired a hitman to 
attack Ronnie Chase Center. I don't know that that's the exact. Re- I'll link the article sh- though. Okay. It's like okay, so police did at one point think there was a hitman until Laramie called in with his tip and said, "No, it's this black guy down the hall," and the police were like, "Oh, okay." We'll just make sure that, you know, everything we say and do points to him. That, th- that's my takeaway. Right. I believe it was The Hollywood Reporter that came out with another article about this in November, which I'll link, where there's just a strong push to try to get the BHPD to either reopen the case and turn it over to another jurisdiction or now that yeah. there is a new chief on board to have him, you know, take another look at things, which they should do because I really don't think that this case is solved. Again, I'm not accusing anyone here, but I do think, you know, maybe they should talk to Laramie again just to see how his story's holding up. (sighs) That was a good phrase, a good way to put that. I'm trying to be very neutral. Mm -hmm. Tell us what you guys think. Uh, Let us know your thoughts in the comments. You can do that on Instagram, Facebook, or YouTube at Horwood Podcast. Or send us an email at horrorwoodpodcast at gmail.com. And if you really love us and you want more of us, uh, you can jump on over to Patreon and become one of our Misfit Murnerinos at www.patreon.com slash horrorwoodpodcast. I haven't heard a www dot in a very long time. I don't know. I really just wanted to do it. Like as you were going, I was like, duh. I'm ready. I'm ready for the (laughs) I'm ready. I'm ready. W. Uh, And don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. It helps us out a ton. And don't do murder, I guess, is the lesson here. Yeah. Don't do murder, I guess, if you have to, but, like, don't do it. But if you're going to do it, make sure you have a getaway car. But, like, don't do murder. But don't. Yeah. 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 Or, like, if you're on a bike and you did actually do it, Take your bike with you, but like also don't do murder. And if you're going to do murder, make sure you get caught. That's my takeaway there. Yeah, you better fucking get caught if you do some murder. But don't do murder. Mm -hmm.